Hello, and welcome back to our continuing series on modern cloud-native application development. Today, we're going to continue talking about contract first and apply it to the creation of a user interface as a modern single-page web application. To get started, we have some pre-configured code that you can download that's the beginnings of a user interface. And I'll show you as we go through how we apply contract first to rapidly add features and functionality to that code. So the first thing I want to do is clone the repository. So git clone. And the link to this code will be attached to this video so that you can follow along as well. Now that we have this code, we can cd into the contract first UI. We can run WebStorm. and open the application in my ID. So in order to get started with this, we're going to need a couple of tools installed. So I'm going to open a terminal. And the first thing we want is we want to make sure that we have Gem, which is a Ruby tool for installing packages. If you don't, pause the video, install Gem. Uh, in certain Linux distributions, you may have to use sudo to run Gem commands. What we're going to do is sudo gem install, and we're going to install an application called Fakeit. Fakeit allows us to produce a mock API server based on an open API specification file. So the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to start up that mock API server using the open API YAML file that's included in this source code that you downloaded. So this open API YAML file is our to do's API You'll notice that each our to-do items have uh, an ID, a title, and whether or not it's been completed. Uh, we have an example in our to-do item. All right, so let's start up that mock API server. We're going to type fake it. Spec is openapi.yaml. Port is 7080. And the reason I choose 7080 is if you look at the top of our OpenAPI specification, our server is defined by default to use localhost port 7080. That's to make it easier for local development work. We'll start that up. And I'm going to rename this little terminal tab to be fake it so I know what's running there. And I'm going to open a new terminal. So we could actually do curl HTTP colon slash slash local host port 7080 slash to do's and we'll see that we get back some to do's from the API. Uh, fake it just inserts some fake strings in here, uh, randomly selects a boolean, randomly generates UUIDs for the ID. This is exactly what we want. This allows us to do development against a fake API without actually having had to have write any code for the backend yet. Now, the next step is that we want to use our old friend OpenAPI Generator to generate the client code for interfacing with that API using that API spec. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to install two new development dependencies in our NPM project. If you don't have Node.js and NPM version 12 or higher, pause the video, go install them, and you can follow along after you come back. So I'm going to, in this project, NPM install save dev, open API tools, open API generator CLI, 
and then the NPM watch. Now this didn't take a few moments. Uh, NPM isn't exactly the fastest thing in the world unless maybe you have a local cache. We're also just going to run npm install to make sure that all the rest of our dependencies are installed locally. And while that's installing, I'm going to open up our package.json file. And we'll see that the open API generator and the npm watch dependencies have been added and we're going to create two new scripts entries the first one is to build our client sdk using open api generator and this should be a relatively familiar command if you've done any of our other contract first segments we're using open api generator generate we're inputting a yaml file that has the open api spec we're telling it what type of generator to use. In this case, we're generating a TypeScript Axios client, and we're outputting it into source API client. Now, Axios is a library that allows us to do asynchronous HTTP requests with a focus on REST. TypeScript gives us strong typing, which allows us to more effectively use our integrated development environment and get IntelliSense or autocomplete or whatever you want to call it. The second script we're going to add is a watch script. And the watch script uses that NPM watch and allows us to watch this openapi.yaml and when it changes it will automatically rebuild our client SDK. And the way we make that work is we add a new block here called watch we specify the name of the script and what it should watch for, that openapi.yaml file. So once I start this watch command, anytime openapi.yaml is modified, saved, updated, we're going to rebuild that API client and overwrite the existing. Awesome. So at this point, we can say npm run watch. And you'll see that the first time we start up, it rebuilds our client SDK and outputs it into source API client. I'm going to rename this terminal tab as well, watch API, so that I know that that's running there. And I want to leave that running as well. The last little bit of setup is we want to run this web application in developer mode, which means anytime we make a change to any of the source code, the application will retranspile, reload, everything will be displayed to us. And to do that, we're using a, a web toolkit, a front end toolkit based on Vue.js. It's called Quasar Framework. And Quasar Framework has a dev mode server. You just type Quasar dev. Now, if you don't have Quasar installed yet, pause the video and run this command. npm install dash dash global at Quasar forward slash CLI. Now, depending on your operating system and how you have Node.js installed, you may, use, may need to use sudo in front of that. Uh, I'm using NVM or Node Version Manager, which means that node and npm are installed in my home directory so i don't need to use sudo and we will install that quasar cli globally and run quasar dev and you'll see that quasar starts transpiling our typescript and vue.js and view component code and it pops up and tells me it's going to start a browser with our application running in it. So I'm going to move that to one side. I'm going to move my IDE to the other side. And as we go through this video, you'll see on the right hand side as I make changes that our to-do app 
will instantly update. For the time being, we're done with package JSON. Let's go ahead and close that. Now, we know that our open API generator created our API client. We can see it here. Here's all the code. And we can actually look at that and we can see that it created uh, types for our various schemas. So we have a new to do type. We have a to do type that extends new to do. Uh, it created the API. It also created a configuration class that will allow us to configure that API client later down the road. So that's there. But we really don't even have to think about that code. That code is basically a black box that we don't care about. And we don't want to have to care about it. it the API specification handles all of that for us. Uh, you also might notice that we get some errors down here. Most of these are, are TypeScript errors, and I just haven't bothered to resolve them yet. You can safely ignore them. So the very first thing we want to do is we want to wire our client SDK into this Vue.js app. Quasar provides us this concept of a boot file, which basically allows us to do things before the as the application is starting up. And we're going to insert some code into this Axios boot file that will add a dollar sign API field to all of our view components. So any view component in the rest of our application will have this dollar sign API with another field underneath it called to do's that maps to our to do's API client. And you can see that our client is imported here from source API client. So at this point, once I've wired that client in, it's now available in all of my Vue.js components. The framework, the toolkit we use to build this UI is somewhat irrelevant. I chose Quasar and Vue.js because I'm most familiar and most productive with them. But this should work in React. It should work with Angular. It should work with just plain old jQuery. So what we're going to do is now I'm going to show you how we can implement the loading of our to-do items from our mock API server. So you'll notice that our main layout script section in this view, this is our type script that implements the logic of this component, has basically nothing in it. And we're going to create a unit test because we like to practice test first development. And our unit test is going to be main layout dot spec Dot .ts. Now, dot .ts is TypeScript, and what this test is going to look like is relatively straightforward, but we'll talk through a little bit of the contents. So this test is using Jest as its testing toolkit, and so you'll see that we're importing Jest and expect to do our assertions. Uh, it's also using view test utils, which allows us to shallow mount components and customize the local view instance. Uh, we're importing our main layout.view file, which was created before you downloaded this code. Uh, we're importing the view instance and we're importing the view router because main layout actually has a router container for page routing. Uh, we're also impl importing all of the Quasar components and registering them. That way we don't have to individually import them. Uh, this adds a little memory overhead, but seeing as it's only for testing, not a big deal. And then we're going to do behavior-driven development on this component. So we're going to say describe main layout. And we're going to set up our local view instance. We're going to load those Quasar components. And we're going to tell it to use the view router. And then in an individual test, we're going to say main layout attempts to load to do items when it's mounted. So this is saying that as soon as you instantiate that main layout component in the view UI, 
it's going to attempt to load a list of to-dos from our API service. Best practices around unit testing, though, says that we should mock all external dependencies. And so that's what we're going to do here. We're going to mock the get to do method. We're going to mock the storage of our cached to do's in the global state store of Vue.js called Vuex. We're going to mock showing and hiding the loading indicator in the UI. And we're going to say that when we call that mock get to do's, it returns a resolved promise with an empty array. And so what we see here is we're setting up a data structure for those mocks. And if you've ever worked with Vue or Quasar, you'll know that Vue allows you to attach certain um, uh, universal or, or global event bus items to the Vue instance. Uh, in Quasar, dollar sign Q is for all the Quasar special stuff. Uh, dollar sign store is for the Vuex global store cache in the browser. And in our instance, dollar sign API is our API client. And so we're going to attach all those mocks and we're going to use that shallow mount to mount our component. Shallow mount basically says mount this component, but none of the other child components. Uh, because we want to keep this isolated. And we're going to use our local view instance, and we're going to use our mocks, and we're going to wait one tick. A tick isn't necessarily an exact period of time. It's basically giving the view system a chance to re-render and resolve promises. And then we're going to check and make sure that all of our mock methods were called. Now, remember, looking back at our component, we haven't implemented any code yet. So if we run this test, we should expect it to fail. And that is exactly what happened. It says, hey, your mock, you said you wanted it to be called at least once. It's been called zero times. Test fails. So now we need to implement the code that will make that test pass. We're following that typical guideline of unit testing, red, failing test, green, write just enough code to make the test pass, and then refactor. If you feel like the, the solution isn't good enough, doesn't solve the entire problem, you go back and you write a new test that's red, green, refactor, red, green, refactor. That should be your mantra when you're writing tests. So to implement our code, we're going to go back into our main layout view. And here's what we're going to do. In view, every component has lifecycle hooks. And one of those lifecycle hooks is called mounted. So by implementing a mounted method in this main layout class, this will be called as the component gets mounted into the UI, or in our case, shallow mounted by our testing framework. And we're going to tell Vue.js to show a loading indicator. And then we're going to use our API to request that it gets to do's. And if it's successful, it will call load to do's on mount here. If it fails, it's going to call handle API error here. So on a successful Axios response, we're going to hide the loading indicator, and then we're going to commit the response to our global state cache, uh, the Vuex state store. If it fails, we're still going to hide the loading indicator, but we're going to notify, we're going to use the, the notify snack bar capability in Quasar to let the user know, hey, there was an error, and here's what the error message was. So let's save that component, switch back to our, oh, wow, that was quick. So as soon as I saved that change, did you notice on the right-hand side in our browser that it just started working? Data showed up. Wow, that's really fast development. Uh, I love that capability. 
and you'll see that it's just generating random data. Uh, these, I believe, are all book titles that uh, Fake It is implementing. But we can also now go to our unit test and rerun it. So we run our unit test. And if we did our jobs correctly, yes, we have a green test. This is excellent. Perfect. Exactly what we wanted. And we're not going to do any more testing during this, but I highly recommend that you do test first development as you go forward in your UI development. So now we've wired up our API client to our mock API server, and it would work with a real server as well. But uh, we've shown our user interface to our stakeholders, and our stakeholder says, okay, this is this is pretty good, but uh, it, in the real world, here's what I need. I need a due date over here on the right-hand side before the completion check mark. And, and I also need the ability to add like a longer description, more details about it to do, but I don't necessarily want that to show in the initial view. I want to be able to like expand a twisty or something and, and show that detail as desired. Okay, so we've got our marching orders. We need two new fields. We need a description and a due date. So we go to our open API specification. We scroll down to our data type definition. And I'm going to add, I'm going to zoom in a little bit so this is easier to see. I'm going to add description of type string to our API specification. And I'm going to add due date also of type string but with a format of date. Now I saved that, and if we look over here in our terminal at our watch API, you'll see that we've regenerated our client API already. And then the Quasar dev mode noticed that our client API source code changed, and that's why you saw this web page refresh on the right because it retranspiled, it reloaded. And if we look at the dev tools inside of here on the network, refresh, and we look at that call to the to do's API here, and at the response, we'll see that it's already returning descriptions and due dates for us. Because the fake it API server also noticed that the open API spec changed and adjusted itself to return the appropriate results. This is fantastic. This is so fast. So every time we refresh, we're going to get new randomized data. But now we need to show those two new fields. So we're going to go under source pages index.view and we're going to modify this a little bit to add our new fields to this user interface. So to show the description is actually relatively quick and easy. If we look in here, here is the title. So for example, this the Daffodil Sky title here. And what I'm going to use is what's called a Q expansion item component. And that Q expansion item component will give us a little twisty here on the right that if we expand it, we can show that description. But only if that description is available. So we've got our Q expansion item. We say if to do has a description, we're going to add that Q expansion item with our to do description. Otherwise, it's just going to show to do.title. And as soon as we save this, we see in our UI that the twisty appears and it has randomized data from the mock API server. Wow, that's fast. That's easy. So there, we've, we've taken care of one issue that our stakeholders brought to us. So the next one is a little more complicated. The due date requires a little more work. Uh, first, we're going to need a method called isOverdue to check and see if our due date is already passed. 
So down here inside of our component class, we're going to add a new method called isOverdue. All right. Next, we're going to add a new column to our grid here. It's going to be just next to this checkbox. So up here, we're going to add that column. And if we save that, we're going to see that do column, but it doesn't have any data under it because we haven't updated the actual column itself. We just added a new column header. And so to add that column header just above where the checkbox is here, we're going to add that new column as a div. And finally, because we don't want to just show the date, that's kind of not that friendly. What we'd really like to show is how many days are remaining until the due date or how many days past the due date, perhaps. We're going to create a filter implementation. Now, filters are ways of changing the way data is rendered. So you see here, we've got our due date and we're piping that through this days remaining filter, but we haven't created that filter yet. So we go down here to our component annotation and we add a filter that basically checks to see if our due date is undefined or null. Uh, if it is, it returns just an empty string. Uh, then we parse our string due date. We get an instance of the date today. We set the hours for both to be zero, zero hours, zero minutes, zero seconds. That's that way we only get differences in days. Uh, we create a conversion constant, which is 1000 milliseconds in a second times 60 seconds in a minute times 60 minutes in an hour times 24 hours in a day. And we store that as two days conversion. And we take one date, subtract the other date, divide it by our two days conversion. And that's how many days between due date and the current date there are. If that difference is less than zero, that means we're past our due date. And so we say math.absolute to get rid of the negatives days ago. So it was due X number of days ago. If it's equal to zero, we just say it's due today. And if it's greater than zero, we say it's due in X number of days. And so when we save that, you see our UI on the right updates and says, oh, all of these are overdue. Oh, that's terrible. But that's just because of the random nature of the data that's being sent back by our mock API server. But you see, we've implemented two new fields in our open API spec and hardly had to do very much work at all to add those capabilities to our user interface. Now, part of that is the productivity of modern single page application frameworks, but a lot of it has to do with just being able to use contract first approaches. We didn't have to think about HTTP paths. We didn't have to think about cores headers. We didn't have to think about any of the minutia required for implementing REST clients in a front end because OpenAPI Generator, Fakeit, and our tooling did all of that for us. And that's the real power of using contract first. With that, I hope you've enjoyed this segment. I hope you've learned something new. And I hope you're excited to try this out in your engagements and in your work going forward. Thank you for your time.